Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's event from the City of Westminster Archives Centre. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, Nick Ross. I'm sure most of you out there will think of him in his roles as a journalist and from the many years that he presented Crime Watch. However, today he will be discussing how he turned these investigative skills to researching the amazing history of his own neighbourhood, Orm Square. And I'm happy to say that some of this research actually happened right here at the Archive Centre and it was on one of his visits to us that my colleague Gillian Staples um, asked him to do this talk. Um, Gillian's actually with me here as a co-presenter today and we're both very grateful um, to Nick for saying yes, so thank you very much Nick. Thank you also to all of you in the audience who have joined us here from home. Just to let you know that after the talk there will be a Q&A uh, and we're very much looking forward to seeing your questions. Well that's all from me, I will hand you over to Nick. Thank you very much, Susie, and thank you, Susie, and thank you, Gillian, for the treasure trove at the Westminster Archives. And incidentally, for people who haven't been there, um, I just I warn you, the, the staff there, the archivists, are exceptionally helpful. Um, I hope I'm not going to drum up too much too much work for them. As Susie says, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I'm not a historian. This is the first time I have had a go at that. Uh, other than that, I suppose journalism is. Uh, very similar in the way that you research things. I'm actually also interested in science. I'm a, a trustee of something called Sense About Science, much involved in that. And actually it occurs to me, and long has, that history is a science. In other words, you can have a theory, uh, but actually it's no good unless you can test it. And that theory, even when you've tested it, is only provisional because some new facts can come along. You're always trying to join up the dots and you've always got to be aware of cognitive bias. You, you make assumptions and those stick with you uh, and they're very, very sticky assumptions, very hard to get, get around. And a lot of unknowns. And the more I've gone through this, the more I've been certain I've sorted something and then found, oh, no, I haven't. Um, the other thing I'd say at the beginning is one thing I've discovered that history is basically a retelling of history. Um, pretty much the only way you can find out about the past is by going to things that are already somewhere on a record. People didn't intend them to be part of history, but they're written down. And that means that it's very partial. For example, the 200 year history that I'm looking at, most for most of it, it was very much a male chauvinist world. There's far less on the record about women than there is about men, almost nothing about children and virtually nothing about servants, which make up the vast majority of the residents of parts of London for much of the 19th and even into the early part of the 20th century. And apart from the electoral roll, the electoral register, it's very hard to find out who were the servants, let alone anything about their lives. So it's very, very partial. It always is. I'll show you how I got started. Um, I mean, this was really a lockdown venture and it started, um, I was going to do, I don't know, 10 pages of, of research just for, for local residents. I got interested, it became 20 pages and then I became almost um, anorak obsessed and it's now something like 200 pages, far more than I need to go into now. This is what it's about, where I live, Orm Square. Um, and I, I called it the first 200 years. I didn't actually know at the time I started that it is exactly 200 years. That was a discovery on the way. So let's locate Orm Square. Uh, within that red ring is the square mile, the city of London. And as you can see by 1785, by towards the end of the 18th century, uh, London had expanded quite a bit beyond the square mile. It had gone south quite a bit and it had spread all the way west but there was nothing beyond Park Lane. And even some of the houses you see there weren't actually houses in 1785. Uh, that was all speculative building in that part there. Beyond that, open countryside. And of course, this is what it looks like today. Anybody who knows West London, uh, beyond Park Lane is Hyde Park and about one and a half miles away. Ringed up there is Orm Square. Now, of course, comfortably, within zone one. It's absolutely regarded as, as central London. And it's remarkable to think that a couple of hundred years ago, it was, well, embosomed in the countryside. Although the distance from London, uh, this is uh, Faulkner. Um, it's a wonderful uh, piece of, of, of writing, various things he says about Kensington and, and Bayswater. Although the distance from London is scarcely three miles, yet the traveler might imagine himself to be embosomed in the most sequestered parts of the country. For nothing is heard to interrupt the course of his meditations but the notes of the lark, the linnet or the nightingale. Um, try saying that uh, today where we live. But that was Thomas Faulkner uh, in uh, 1820. 
This is Ormond Square today, looking south towards the park. It's the it's the houses in the bottom right hand corner of that, and it's a, a private square. It's it's private actually again by historical accident. Paddington Council, for some reason or other, never wanted to uh, uh, adopt it and never did. This is what it looked like in 1901. Very, very similar today. The fashions have changed a bit, it must be said. We now have colour photography. That is what Bayswater Road looked like in 1901 before it was officially called Bayswater Road. I think it was mostly called the Uxbridge Road. Orm Square is that collection of houses. There's a terrace on the left and there's a gap because there's a horseshoe with more houses in there and then another terrace. Uh, so that's Orm Square looking towards London, 1901. Um, and actually, I'm going to go back to this. Um, this is how it started. Um, this is the first development, if you like, beyond Park Lane uh, and actually probably predated Park Lane, uh, certainly predated its name, and that was the Tyburn Gallows. It's hard to understate the importance of the gallows in London's history and in the, this part of London's history. Uh, indeed, the term going west comes from the fact that the prisoners to be hanged went to the western extremity of London, beyond the realm of the uh, guys who ran the city uh, and beyond the point where the smells from people who'd been hanged and, and left there in gibbets would uh, interrupt ordinary people. Also on a crossroads, as you can see from the left, of two Roman roads. And this tree, this uh, it was called the Tyburn tree, this uh, triple one was put up in, in 57, 1571 and that could hang 24 people at once. Um, it was known as the Tyburn tree that bears fruit all year round. Um, there'd been gallows there since 1196 at very least, uh, about a league from London. Called Tyburn because of uh, the little river, actually a tributary of the Westbourne, probably not the Tyburn River that flows further east down what's now Bond Street, but the Westbourne, which flows through this area, uh, created a lot of marshy ground, which is where, from where Bayswater gets its name. Estimated that some 60,000 people were mostly hanged here, some, some were, were burned. Um, a pretty uh, appalling way in which people were executed. Uh, it was often known as the Tyburn jig because the, the hanging often didn't break people's necks. The, the drop was very short and they could writhe in agony for a very, very long time. Um, it closed in 1783, not before time, before about 60, 000, after about 60,000 people, uh, it's ex es estimated, had been executed there. One of the features that remains, apart from at the junction near what's today Marble Arch, where you can see there's a, a memorial to, to Tyburn, but just across the road is Speaker's Corner. And that really started because one of the things that pe the condemned people could do would give their last confession. And sometimes, far from a confession, uh, they would say exactly why they were a member of the Catholic faith or why it was that they refused to, to recant. And that, of course, is now Speaker's Corner, where people still speak their minds. I said that this was a, a very marshy area, and so it was. Here's the, the Bayswater conduit from which water was extracted and sent into the City of London. This is all Bishop of London's land. Um, I, it gets his name, actually, almost certainly from a man called Bernardus, who was one of the key people in the Norman Conquest, one of William's henchmen. And I know some accounts of the Norman Conquest uh, give a rather rose-tinted view of it. It was utterly ferocious. Uh, a man who claimed to be the king of England had absolute contempt for the people of England. Not only did he steal the lands, but there was a lot of brutality as well. Uh, we might come to that a li little bit later because it does have, have relevance here. But this area, as you can see, in 1775, still way out in the countryside, that may be the little pa uh, hamlet of Paddington or Westbourne in the distance, I'm not quite sure. But beyond that, you see way, way out uh, towards Harrow on the hill. Here, though, the air was so good, um, and because it was, there was so much water, it was regarded as very health-giving, there were uh, tea shops, or, or, or rather a, a tea house. Um, the tea gardens here were, were quite well known. 
At uh, one stage, they were owned by a, a quack. Even in his own day, he was known as a quack. He would um, grow herbs and sell them at exorbitant prices, claiming they, they cured just about anything. Uh, around him were other farmers growing uh, things which were uh, more honorable and honest, um, especially watercress around here, which obviously did, did rather well. And because people would come here to take the air, uh, it was regarded as, as such health giving place. Uh, the smoke of London, incidentally, because of the prevailing winds, would go east. So coming west, beyond Tyburn, the horrible parts of Tyburn, and particularly after Tyburn closed, became attractive. And indeed, it attracted some very, very wealthy people. These would be the super rich of the time. And uh, Cope Castle, um, which, uh, as you can see from the caption, became a girls' school, uh, and Camden House. Um, Holland House, unfortunately, was uh, hit by incendiary bombs during the, the Blitz in the 1940s, and most of it burned to the ground. Uh, Camden House didn't need any bombs. It burned to the ground entirely of its own accord, very, very sadly. But one of these great houses survived, and that's this one, Sir George Coppins. Uh, they didn't have photographs at the time. We didn't uh, uh, have anything other than this to go on, which is as it was imagined from various descriptions of it. But we now know it, of course, as Kensington Palace. And this, this is uh, taken up by Queen Mary and King Billy, uh, King William, the, the Orangeman, uh, who, although if anybody knows Northern Ireland, will know that King Billy is regarded as a, a strong man and a, a ferocious fighter for Protestantism, he was in fact an asthmatic and suffered very badly in the smoke of London. And I love the way, incidentally, when I've been looking up um, documents uh, about the smoke of London, and it's mentioned a lot, it's mostly spelt S-M-O-A-K. So for people who insist on being spelling bees today, we should remember that in Shakespeare's time and beyond that, uh, spelling was, well, pretty much as you made it up and as you came across it. The, the Roman road uh, was just uh, north of this palace, and um, this was where the ordinary people would go. On the left of this, this picture uh, is the wall that was erected to keep the game into Hyde Park because it was used for, for hunting and to keep the people out. On the right is the Swan Inn, and this is a painting in 1775 on the left, and on the right is the Swan Inn as it is today. Uh, I had to take the photograph from this angle because if you take it from any other angle, there is a hideous attachment that somebody has allowed long before we had uh, proper planning regulations, which has really destroyed the, the appearance of this wonderful inn as you look westwards uh, from, from the London side of it. But that inn is still there, uh, one of the last, actually the last of the surviving 17th and 18th century inns in the area. And you can see it's quite busy, uh, quite a busy road. Uh, again, a wonderful description of this period from George Russo, um, consisting of green fields dotted with cow sheds and a few houses. Even a generation later, when Haydn retreated there in 1791, he called it rural Paddington. Its fields dipped and rose and were prone to flooding, but provided its inhabitants could endure wet cellars and rooms, it seemed a small paradise. And during the 1760s, market gardeners and nurserymen found it pastorally seductive because they could plant and grow surrounded by plenty of space and pure air. The land was cheap to buy as well as rent. And that is obviously important for our story. What else is important is the coming of the turnpikes. Uh, until the turnpikes, until the invention of the sprung carriage, it was pretty much impossible to go far out of London unless you're on a serious trek. Sure, you could walk, and of course people walked many, many miles in those days without thinking about it as we would today. Uh, you could go on horseback, but if you were going on cart, it was a very unpleasant, bumpy business. And when the turnpikes came, all of a sudden, Bayswater found itself on the equivalent of the M1, or in fact the M4 as it was. This road, which uh, originally a, a Roman road out to, to, the, to the south and southwest and west, uh, suddenly became easy going for commuters, uh, or not quite commuters. This is looking west towards Orm, Orm Square, and this is looking east towards London. That road on the left, just beyond the, the century or whatever he is, 
is Queensway, uh, what was then called Black Lions Lane. It's had lots of lots of different names. And this was the then called Uxbridge Road, now the Bayswater Road, again with a wall to Hyde Park on the right. This uh, picture and the previous one by a painter called uh, uh, Paul Sandby. Bayswater itself, the stretch in which uh, I live and in which this is all about, on the square, was known as Kensington Gravel Pits, uh, spelt incidentally K I N S I N G T O, gravel often with two L's and pits with two T's. A glorious gravel. Um, I mean, I, I'd never really thought much of gravel until you see the gravel that came out of here. It was of all, almost perfect golden colour. The size was very uniform and it was very valuable. And so all along here were, were gravel pits. They often got uh, flooded uh, in, in winter when the, when the water came. Uh, but far from making this seem commercial or industrial, it only seemed to add to the attractions of the area. Uh, and people uh, like to come and sit beside the, the, the waters that settled in, in some of these gravel pits. So this was, anyway, farmland pitted with uh, gravel beds which had been um, cut out for, well, certainly centuries. And then along comes this chap, Edward Orme. I can't tell you how excited I was. It shows how anorak I've become when I found this signature in the Westminster City Archives. Um, it was a signature on a document uh, which, in fact, the document uh, by which he acquired the uh, part of these, these gravel pits. Edward Orme was uh, quite a remarkable man in his own way. He was an artist who uh, exhibited at the Royal Academy, I think in 1798, something like that. Um, he then realized he was probably better as a seller of art, as a dealer in art, than he was as an artist, more successful at any rate financially, and even more successful as a dealer in illustrations. And he would advertise himself on the front page of the Times, because the Times in those days was just advertisements on the front page, uh, as a print seller to uh, His Majesty. Uh, and eventually he graduated to a shop in Bond Street, which was way out on the west of, of London in those days, uh, specialising in these transparencies. And this book is an essay on transparent prints in 1807. And he was certainly one of, one of the great, if he didn't in, invent them, he was certainly one of the people who pushed transparencies more than anybody else at the time. He also dabbled in property and he bought that tea house in Bayswater, the first thing that he bought. And eventually he put some uh, a few houses up as well. They were so far out of London. There's one of his houses in the background uh, in what's now called Moscow Road at the bottom of what's now called St. Petersburg Place. And this was so far out of London that you couldn't really sell houses to people if they had nowhere to pray. And um, so he built this Chapel of Ease in St. Petersburg Place, uh, which was then called Chapel Row or Chapel Place uh, because of it's rather, it's rather lovely. It's since been replaced by, I think, a much less glorious uh, Victorian edifice. Even so, I, though I don't much like it, it's grade two listed, so obviously somebody is. But this is the uh, Chapel of Ease. Um, and this is the indenture, which, wow, uh, why and how Westminster Archives came to have it, I don't know. But the area you see on the left of the screen is the field which now houses, or the south part of it, houses Orme Square. It was known originally as Cox Field. Uh, it became called Cockpit Field, probably because some wag thought of Cockpit because it was so pitted by the, the gravel beds. And we know that Orme had been uh, renting it in the past and, and extracting gravel from it. And now he decided to, to, to buy it. Um, the only access at that stage, you could go from the left from Chapel Row or from uh, Bayswater Road, and he, it's sometimes called Bayswater Road, sometimes called Oxford Road, and he decided just to develop the, the, the southern part of it. Also in the archives is this wonderful map from 1729. At the top of it is Mr. Upton's Land, uh, and just below Mr. Upton's Land is Queensway, uh, Black Lion Lane. Uh, and just beyond Mr. Upton's land is where we're talking about is uh, Orme Square, as it was later built uh, about 100 years after this map was drawn. Uh, incidentally, just below Mr. Upton's land, you can see the land uh, has been separated into strips. And we know that the Uptons 
uh, leased out little strips of land to, to, to local farmers. And there's what's called Oxford Arms Field. That pub, the Oxford Arms, stood there uh, until, well, until, what, two or three years ago. Uh, it was demolished. It was a 16th, 17th century pub rebuilt in Victorian times, uh, rather awkwardly, it must be said, and, and, and now long gone. And now there's a new block of uh, flats, what I call unaffordable housing, going, going up there. Um, this is the earliest description we've got of the square. It comes from a biography of John Sterling by Thomas Carlyle. And that's John Sterling's house in the corner of the square. It's now called number 12, though Thomas Carlyle thought it was number five. He must have been wrong. Um, I might as well read this to you because by the time you've read it, I could have read it out loud. Um, he says the Sterling study was uh, mainly the drawing room looking out safe over the dingy grass plot in the front and the quiet houses opposite. And this is the bit I love. With the huge dust whirl of Oxford Street in London far enough ahead of you as background, as black curtain blotting out only half your blue hemisphere with dust and smoke. On the right, you had the continuous growl of the Oxford Road and its wheels coming as lullaby, not interruption. Leftwards and rearwards, <clears throat> excuse me, after some thin belt of houses lay near country, bright, sweeping, green expanses crowned by Pleasant Hampstead, Pleasant Harrow, with their rustic steeples rising against the sky. What I find so splendid about that description is the huge dust whirl of Oxford Street and London. And the more I've looked, the more it's, I've recognized just how filthy, dirty, and noisy London was in those days. Uh, of course, <clears throat> people <clears throat> now in their 70s and 80s and 90s will remember that London was always black with, with, with soot right up until the Clean Air Act, or whatever it was, the, the 1960s. But this idea that it was constantly in a veil of dust. It's also nice that the, the road here wasn't that busy with the wheels coming as lullaby, not interruption, but also that this was still countryside in the 1850s. This was almost certainly here then, uh, guarding the front of the square. There's been more comment about this. is the only thing for which Orm Square has ever got any fame. Uh, people going down the Bayswater Road towards Oxford or towards Shepherd's Bush or wherever, or going into London, have wondered what on earth this bird was on top of this double Tuscan column. Um, some said it was an eagle, some said it was a Russian eagle, uh, but a Russian eagle has got two heads, not one. Others said it was a French eagle because the French embassy was in the square. Well, I've discovered the French embassy wasn't in the square, and it's not a French eagle anyway. Others said it was a phoenix, perhaps because Orm was uh, registered, his houses were insured with a Phoenix Insurance Company. Well, that seems pretty improbable. Uh, my guess is it was bought from the equivalent of a junk shop and put up here uh, in order to draw attention to the square, which is certainly what it's done. Incidentally, uh, we discovered a few years ago, only, well, actually two years ago, that it's an extraordinary thing uh, because it's made of solid lead. And that's why it's got a double Tuscan column to bear the weight. And uh, the Queen's statuary expert, who happens to, to know one of the residents here, was brought in and uh, scraped away the paint, said it's solid lead, suspected it was uh, created by French prisoners of war uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. So uh, we have another mystery, not just that, but early maps show at the north end of the square two strange structures which are in front of the houses. Now, no one will put a privy in front of the houses. You wouldn't put your horses or your carriages in front of the houses. So what on earth were they? Uh, the map on the right is in the 1830s, which is far too late for these still to be builders' cabins. Um, and I just wondered, are they sentries? Uh, sentry boxes or something? Because, of course, this was built before the establishment of the Metropolitan Police. This is when you guarded your own property because nobody else was going to guard it for you. Um, that remains to me a mystery. Another mystery was uh, this map of the uh, 1920s, which shows that there is uh, an extension which certainly doesn't exist now. And I found it on 1860s maps as well. And nobody knows what that was, that little bit in there. Um, I've got aerial photographs from the 1940s and judging by the, the, 
the shadows. It wasn't there. Uh, maybe it was bombed uh, in the war and disappeared then. I don't know. So it's one of the many things that w was a mystery. But some things we have uncovered, or I have uncovered in this. Um, this one, not thanks to the archives, this one thanks to builders. This is the other reason that Orm Square is so well known. Most of the houses here are frankly, uh, they were pretty mediocre, not very well built, probably not architect built, maybe built from a, a pattern book, copied from a pattern book. But these grand new classical houses, I mean, these are something else. So Orm obviously had grand ambitions. Or did he? Because what I discover is that the from the rate books, and thanks to the archives for that, the rates more than doubled, in fact tripled uh, at some stage. And somebody had done something very dramatic to what were probably two very modest houses originally. And when you look at the front of them, you find that there's new brickwork and it's not even stitched into the old brickwork. So clearly what had happened is sometime between the 1860s and 1880s, a new neoclassical facade was put onto the front of these houses and they were made re hugely expanded and made very, very grand indeed. That was before the most famous resident of the square moved in, Roland Hill, who was here in the 1840s. And he was here before he was uh, very famous. Um, and incidentally, I discovered that he hadn't invented the postal system. Uh, the, the monarchy had had a postal system for ages. It had been opened up to the, the public. Stamps had been around for ages. In fact, uh, contracts were signed across a, a, a postage stamp uh, in order to show that you'd, you'd paid the requisite amount. What he did is he brought the postal service up to the age and requirements of the Industrial Revolution. And by bringing the postage price down dramatically, he vastly increased the popularity of the post. And curiously, uh, he was followed at number two next door by this man, Jean Joubert de Ferté, who uh, was a, created one of the most famous stamps. Any, anybody watching who's a, um, a stamp collector, philatelist, will recognize the fourpenny carmine red, uh, which is a, a valuable and, and said to be one of, the, one of the finest engravings of Queen Victoria there ever was. He, by coincidence, lived next door to Roland Hill. Roland Hill was succeeded, incidentally. I discovered this amazing thing about the internet is you can get newspapers from all around the world. And I discovered this from a newspaper in Sydney, Australia. But then this is the original stuff from the High Court. One of the most dramatic divorce cases uh, towards the end of, well, around the, around the turn of the, the uh, 19th or 20th century. Leon Albert, Count Hamel de Manin, uh, said to be one of the most august royal from one of the most august royal families in uh, Europe. Uh, his wife, Anna, sued for divorce, uh, alleging all sorts of things, that he kept a revolver under his bed in Orm Square, that he brandished it, that he threatened people, that he hit her, that he beat people, that he was completely irrational and mad and completely bonkers. Um, he, on oath, denied that he had ever hit a lady and I discovered from uh, the court transcript, it no, was no use talking like that, Count Hamill, since you have been convicted at the police court for assaulting a woman. Anyway, in the end, the court found against him for cruelty and misconduct uh, and awarded uh, Anna a divorce with costs. Um, sometime later, they were followed by another irascible man. Uh, this is Wilfred Harvey. Um, he was as famous then as uh, Bob Maxwell uh, later became, and the parallel is actually much more striking than you might imagine. Wilfred Harvey made his name by buying British Printing Corporation, a BPC, and using it as a fiefdom, basically uh, taking money out of it for himself. And guess what? He sold it to Bob Maxwell, who did exactly the same, stole the pension fund and all the rest. Uh, the rest of that is, is history. William Harvey, incidentally, also had a dramatic break-in. Um, one forgets uh, how much crime has gone down. We, we never talk about declining crime. When he was living in Orm Square in the 60s, it was really the beginning of the post-war burglary rampage, when people for the first time had a lot of wealth in their houses, and they suffered a horrible uh, burglary there, um, what would now be called a, um, an, an aggravated burglary. 
uh, in which his wife was tied up, uh, was beaten, and the, the thieves made off with some jewellery and were later caught and sentenced to, I think, seven and ten years. Uh, next door is a chap called Fred Layton, the other um, very famous chap from, from the square. The artist became Lord Layton. Incidentally, became Lord Layton um, in 1896, uh, and the day after he was ennobled, it was a life period, uh, not a life period, it was a proper uh, inheritance period, um, he, he died, making it the, the, the shortage, shortest period, I think, ever. Uh, what survives is a museum. He built this, or was built for him, an artist studio as part of uh, his his house in Orme Square, and that pretty much still exists. Well, that's the picture taken there just a, just a few years ago. He was followed uh, at some stage by this chap, Ernest Castle, who, who may not be famous now, but my gosh, he was. Um, he was uh, a, a guy who came from nowhere. Actually, he started as a bank clerk but then it just seemed to have a brilliant way with investments and became a friend and advisor of the Prince of Wales. So much so that they, I mean, they looked very similar, as you can tell, they became really close buddies. And there's a wonderful account where somebody says to Bertie, the Prince of Wales, I just asked him about the play. Um, have you seen the importance of being earnest? Uh, to which Bertie re replies, no, sir, but I have seen the importance of being earnest castle. Uh, so he was a pretty significant figure in his time. And Bernard Partridge would have been the greatest cartoonist of his time. Uh, he was the senior cartoonist for Punch, which was the, the great place where you get caricatures of his time. And the, another very well-known couple, um, George uh, Lassells and Marion Lassells, or Lassells, they actually call it Lassells themselves. It's, it looks as though it should be Lassells. Picture on the left shows uh, Mary, the Queen Mother. On the right is King George the, the Sixth. Um, George was a very significant member of the royal family, so much so that when he was captured by the Germans uh, in the war, you could see him ringed on the right, uh, he was sent to Colditz Castle as one of the prominentes, as they were called, who were held as hostage uh, in case the war went badly. Um, they could always be traded or perhaps traded for uh, munitions or for German prisoners. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, Hitler was said to have signed a warrant for George Lassell's um, execution, but the SS general, realizing that that was unlikely to do him any good, uh, put him in a jeep and drove through the lines and handed him over to the Americans. Their marriage broke down. Marion was a, a very accomplished pianist and um, amid a great deal of front page publicity, George swapped a, a pianist for a, for a violinist. And um, as part of the divorce settlement, she, Marion, got to stay in Orm Square. And she took up with this chap, Jeremy Thorpe, one of the other uh, amazingly famous pay people, shall I say, become notorious people uh, to live in Orm Square. That's Marion on his left, and that's his mother to the left of that. Uh, he was leader of the Liberal Party, brought the Liberal Party from a position where it is now, a virtual political irrelevance with just a handful of MPs, to an enormous political triumph. Uh, he was offered a, a role as deputy prime minister in a coalition government. A, all sorts of negotiations went on about a coalition. And eventually, uh, for various reasons, he decided not to, to take it. Uh, then things began to go sour for him. And it turned out that he had had a gay relationship uh, many years before this. And his uh, gay lover <clears throat> had been trying to get some favours out of him. And Jeremy Thorpe thought it was blackmail and a plot was created to get rid of the, the what was thought to be the blackmailer. It became a complete farce, uh, sadly for a dog, uh, which the uh, his gay lover had, had borrowed in order to protect him because he f feared what would happen to him. The dog was shot, uh, but nobody else was, uh, but it still became a trial for attempted murder. And uh, I think to most people's surprise, including his own families, incidentally, um, Jeremy Thorpe was acquitted. And many of you may have seen the film uh, that, uh, that came out of that called A Very British Scandal from a wonderful book uh, of the same name. Because of um, house inflation, there's uh, number three Orm Square as it was in the 1960s or 70s. You can see there's a bit been added on the left. They didn't have planning in those days, conservation areas. So you just put up what you wanted really. 
uh, had no sense of proportion or style compared to the original. Uh, and this is what it looks like now after Heritage England or English Heritage as then became involved along with Westminster City Council planners. But if you look at the right, 1826 is the footprint at first and look how it extended and extended up till 1976. Then planning regulations were in and in 2016 no one was allowed to go beyond that original footprint. Now that has happened all across the square as it has all across London. So this is looking down the aerial photograph of numbers four, five and six. And you can see they've completely colonised their own gardens. Uh, the houses uh, are at least twice as big as they originally were. And um, it, it, you could see this is number four, which had even gone out at the front. These are from pictures I showed earlier uh, from 1900. And there seems to be a sort of glass house extension at the front which is not there at the moment and rather baffle me that. But what is there? Well, that in the square that I've drawn there is the original house. And you can see just how much most of London has been built over. And there is nothing at all left of the garden there at all. One thing in the gardens that you could see to the bottom of that frame uh, that baffled me. Every year around uh, uh, October, end of October, somebody left a, a little poppy for uh, somebody called uh, Paul Lampard, who had obviously died in the Great War. Now, a bit of research, uh, this is Paul Lampard's uh, grave. Uh, he died, it's in Kennel Cemetery near, near Ypres. It's Lance Corporal Paul Lampard, who was uh, killed in action age 21. He was standing beside his brother when a sniper got uh, Paul and another shot almost uh, only a second or two later uh, hit his brother Austin. Uh, Paul died instantly, his brother Austin survived uh, only to be uh, recover and then shot again only to recover and then be shot and seriously injured again just before the end of the war. Uh, when he came back not only did he know of his brother but his father uh, Arthur had died as well. And his Arthur is a fascinating character. He was known as the Rubber King. He was the guy that decided that um, with the coming of the motor car, people would want pneumatic tyres. Pneumatic tyres would want rubber and that rubber in the wild wasn't very good. Why don't we have rubber plantations in places like uh, Malaya? And so he brought a whole idea of uh, in industrialization, if, if you like, of rubber um, to, to the United Kingdom. Another well-known uh, at the time resident, John Passmore Edwards, who was one of the great philanthropists. And the right is uh, what's now a theatre in uh, Shepherd's Bush. But he built that as a public library. He built many, many other public libraries as well. And this is the James Corden of the age. This is a, an actor called John Toole, uh, who lived at uh, number four, the one I said had been extended at fourfold. Um, he, he came to Orm Square in 1875 after returning from New York. Of course, James Corden found a fantastic audience in America and has pretty much uh, uh, made himself uh, a new career there. John Toole went to New York hoping for the same and it didn't quite work. He couldn't establish the same rapport with his audience, but he did write a biography. And that again has a wonderful account of West London, including Orm Square. And I'm gonna read this to you. London is the pleasantest and most wretched town in the world. On a dark, wet day, with the mud of countless wheels churned into paste, it might well become associated in the minds of the French traveller with suicide and murder. But on a sunny day in June, it's a gay, picturesque, soul-inspiring city. On this summer morning in question, Oxford Street merges into the Bayswater Road with a merry clatter of horses' hooves and the whirl of every description of wheel. Omnibus, barouche, Victoria, family carriage, handsome cab, commercial van and the daring bicycle roll along in pleasant accord. A troop of guards gives the traffic a telling touch of colour and the music of a coaching horn is heard above the rush and rattle of the general traffic. It doesn't sound like Marble Arch today. Um, as he reaches the square itself, doesn't go on much longer. The fine houses fronting the park are decorated with flowers and some of them have put forth their outer blinds. 
the little paradise of the successful actor in Orme Square is not the least inviting of the many pleasant houses right and left of it. The windows are open, the flower boxes are full of radiant colour, and the forecourt is white with heartstone polish and yellow with tulip heads. So that was Sir John Lawrence Toole. Uh, at the time, uh, there was, I mean, uh, you've got to remember, which I hadn't realised, that street names were largely made up uh, until quite late, until the post office really tried to regularise things late in the 18th century. So in John Toole's time, this was just a few hundred yards. We had Palace Court, Bayswater Hill, Orme Square, Orme Court, Bayswater Hill, Coburn, Coburg Place. And houses only had numbers in as much as residents wanted to have numbers. So it was impossible for me to work out who lived where in the early Orm Square, or even if they lived in Orm Square or Bayswater Hill, because the addresses seemed to uh, flick from one back to the other. What we do know, though, or what I have discovered, is that the chap on the left, Alexander Montgomery Carlyle, lived in Orm Square, and he was the man who designed the Titanic. He uh, was transposed in the film Titanic by Thomas Andrew, the chap on the right, who was the managing director at the time of the sinking and was indeed on board and did in fact go down with the ship and was portrayed by the actor Victor Geber to, to, on, the, on the right, bottom right. But it was Alexander Montgomery Carlyle who designed the three ships, of which uh, Titanic, of course, is the, is the most famous. And he also invented a, a special sort of davit which could launch as many lifeboats as you needed. And he wanted 64 lifeboats. It's not clear if he resigned because the White Star Line didn't want to put that number on. Uh, but anyway, he left before the maiden voyage and came to live in Orme Square. Uh, another famous resident I've discovered is, is uh, Jeffrey Lawrence, who chaired the Nuremberg trial, the greatest trial in history. And on the picture of the right are people like Goering and Keitel and Ribbentrop and Jodl. Uh, John Mayle, uh, greatest uh, blues player, um, lived in Orm Square. Uh, that's Eric Clapton, um, uh, affecting indifference, reading the Beano. It's known as the Beano cover, that. And uh, you still get girls and, well, uh, some boys as well, uh, outside uh, one of the houses in Orm Square uh, taking photographs because this was where John Mayle used to live. That was a house in that time. Um, it, the outside wall there was sat on by prostitutes. Uh, this was an area frequented by prostitutes and the owner, this is a sketch by um, Felicity Garrett, who lived there, her husband Stephen uh, tried putting soot on the wall, that little dwarf wall there to keep the prostitutes from sitting on it and was rewarded with bricks through the windows so they decided just to, to live with it. Um, they sold that house to a man called Geoffrey Michael Blackburn Kane. Now I'd heard that there were rumours that MI5 or MI6 had had a place in Orm Square. I could never bottom that out. And then it occurred to me to look up some documents uh, about honours. And blow me down, there is a Geoffrey Michael Lindsay Blackburn Kane, who some years after this house was bought, and the reason that it was suspicious is because he came and offered them uh, money for it out of the blue, more than it was worth. Um, he was awarded a CBE, and his citation reads, for services to the nation, being lately senior technical advisor, Ministry of Defence. Well, just opposite there, or a little bit down the road, 100 yards down the road, is the Soviet embassy, uh, or now the Russian embassy. So there you have it. That actually was either a safe house or a listening post or something. Um, I can't end without talking about this guy, Dan Reuther, uh, Edward Dan Reuther, an extraordinary guy. Um, his family, Elo uh, emigrated from Strasbourg when he was a child to the US, to Cincinnati. Unfortunate for them, uh, the Civil War broke out. In 1962, Cincinnati was under siege. Uh, his father's piano business failed. His father died. They were penniless. He was starving. And it was only because his brilliance as a pianist was recognized by fellow Germans living in Cincinnati, or German speakers, they clubbed together and sent him to, to Leipzig. To, to learn the piano. He was spotted there by an Englishman brought to play at Crystal Palace and then became one of the great musicians of his period. He was a great friend of Wagner. Wagner was uh, scarcely known in those days. It was Danreuther who 
not only brought him to Britain, but brought him to much attention throughout the world. Parsifal was first performed, or at least the um, it was the, the, the words that were, were first spoken in that property bottom right. That's not actually the property, uh, only the lower half of it resembles roughly what it was like. That was bombed during the war, but it was a music room that was built by Dan Roy at the back. Uh, he hired Philip, um, uh, what's his name, Philip Webb, uh, the fantastic architect later, was one of, one of Philip Webb, Webb's first patrons. Uh, and designed this wonderful musical, could hold about a hundred people there. And here in Orm Square, who would have known it, was one of the great meeting places for serious musicians in the whole of London, with more novel music works of people, novel at the time, but now regarded as, as, as classical musicians, who performed there for the first time in Britain. And I think I've just got time to mention this chap as well, um, Selwyn Jepson. He was the great recruiter for SOE, the Special Operations Executive during the Second World War. It was he who was a, um, made his name as a novelist, uh, and that's how he earned his income. But uh, he was the guy who recruited agents who then became famous, like Odette and Violetta Sabo, uh, both of whom incidentally finished up in Ravensbrook. Um, uh, Odette managed to, to get home, uh, as quite a few of his agents did. He always believed that women made better agents than men uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Not least, uh, they drew less attention to themselves. Um, the, there was a sexism at the time, they were less suspicious. Uh, and, and also, um, they were just, um, uh, well, more con concentrating on the job than on themselves. The property went up for sale, the whole of this, in uh, 1910. Um, a wonderful photograph of, of Orm Square at the time. Um, and what was fascinating is to think that how London had gone out of, out of town as this famous Crookshank cartoon, the March of Bricks and Mortar. Uh, this was drawn in 1829. This is exactly the period that Orm Square was uh, created. And all the fields are now completely retreated in front of this extraordinary march of the bricks. Um, to the left, um, the Hippodrome, uh, the race course just, just up the road from here, failed, but is now full of housing, become as Notting Hill. Um, the piggeries and potteries uh, that were a bit further down the road is now again completely housing. Uh, across the way, uh, what were fields going down to the palace is now uh, Kensington Palace Gardens. This number eight, incidentally, is what it used to look like. There's now a modern block of flats there. That was a rather shameful period of British history in the Second World War. It was known as the cage, and it's where uh, German prisoners were brought. Uh, sometimes spies, sometimes other prisoners, and frankly, um, whatever else history records, uh, officially, uh, there was a lot of torture that went on there, which is a rather shameful thing. And no doubt the Russians, whose embassy is now next door, uh, are well aware of that uh, shady history. Paddington Station, just up the road, originally went through uh, to get to the original station, you went through the arches of the bridge. That's the approach to the bridge over the canal until the new station was built about uh, 10, 20 years later. Uh, GWR's seven foot gauge railway. I hadn't realized just how big that was compared to the trains we have today. Um, the surviving pub uh, in um, at the, at the, at the, you could just see there uh, in, in, at the bottom of Porchester Road, uh, and Bishop's Bridge Road. That's what it used to look like um, back in the eight, 18th century. It's been brought forward, uh, but otherwise the position is more or less the same. I'm afraid not as picturesque as it used to be. Whitelist just behind us, burned down in a great fire, um, then rebuilt and now being rebuilt again. Um, I won't go through this. The area was bombing, a lot of bombing, a lot of damage, including to the square. And now uh, a lot of old houses being knocked down with modern stuff like this Richard Seaford Hotel just next door. The point I've discovered is, you know, I've just taken this tiny little ring of 12 houses in this tiny part of London. I reckon you could put that ring pretty much anywhere in a great circle of London, anywhere that's more than 100 years old, certainly any more that's 200 or more years old, and find a history as rich um, as this one and find if you're lucky, people who are as anorak as I am and as locked down as I am who, who are prepared to investigate it. Uh, anyway, it's been great fun for me doing this. I hope it's been of, of some interest to you.
Nick, that was fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, the Q&A is now open and um, don't be shy folks, um, you know, just to remind you to post a question in the Q&A, uh, you just need to click on the little um, icon with uh, a speech bubble and a question mark uh, and then start typing. Uh, we do have a number of questions in the Q&A already, so um, if that's okay with you Nick, we'll get going on that. Uh, so the first question, uh, sorry one second. Uh, first question is by Thomas. He said, um, you mentioned at the start of your excellent talk um, that the history of Orm Square largely focused on the powerful, typically dead white men, and there is little on servants and women. I wonder what history will be available 200 years in our own time. From your experience, do you think that there is now simply too much information available on the internet and censuses and that this will no longer be a problem? Or will some crucial details of parts of the population be scarce for future historians? Uh, if so, which parts of their lives and which demographics? It's a big question. <laughs> it's a fabulous question, Thomas. And I'm, I've got a, a history of this because for many, many years I was involved in um, r reporting on crime and working with the police on, on trying to resolve crime, uh, the BBC programme Crime Watch, among others, and I'm still connected with the police. And it fascinates me those stories that get into the papers and make a huge splash or onto television as well, on, on, on radio. And it's a very small subsection of crime. And I think it's the same with any sort of history. So we have at the moment a dreadful case, I'm not going into it now, where a, a woman has disappeared and lots of other women are being uh, quoted on, on uh, BBC radio as saying they're frightened and all the rest. I mean, you know, the, if you want to be frightened of homicide, you should be under 12 months of age because that's your most vulnerable age. If you want to be frightened of homicide, you should be male uh, because twice as many males are killed as females. Uh, and, and so forth. I could go on and on about that. But the same is true of history. The things that excite us are the same sort of things that I suppose would excite the newspapers. And so I think it's inevitable that those who have colourful lives, whether for good, uh, like inventing the, the penny post, or whether for ill, like having a, a notorious divorce case, those are the things which are going to get most publicity. Those are the things people are going to, to remember most. Whereas the, the servant, a uh, girl who is still called a girl, even though she's probably in her 20s or 30s, um, who is wonderful, gives a, a, a proportion of her meagre salary or wages away, uh, works diligently, is a wonderful mum and all the rest of it. History so far has never heard of her and I suspect never really will in future. I think history is made of the tittle-tattle that interests us uh, and the, there isn't much of a sense of proportion when it comes to, to, to narrative. I don't think there ever will be. That's, it's human nature. But I hope I'm wrong. I suppose that's one thing in, in a way that it has in common with the, the journal, with journalism and news and uh, yes. it picks on the sensationalist. Yes, and, yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it picks on what we're already interested in and that's why it's sensational. So, for example, there's a lot of talk about racism uh, because of the royal couple. Nobody has pointed out that when more than 300 schoolgirls were abducted at gunpoint, it hardly registered in the press or on the news here on television, even in public service broadcasting like the BBC. Why? They were black. Can you imagine 300 white school children being abducted at gunpoint? So, the, the the narrative, Nigeria is a long way away. Most people here just don't identify with them. And I, I, it's much the same with history. We're going to pick out those bits. That, oh, God, that's juicy. That's the bit that interests me. And I suspect, Thomas, it'll be the same in 200 years time. But what do I know? Right, we've got uh, another one. You mentioned a book that had a description of West London. I missed the reference. Was it a biography of John Tour or a book by him? Oh, that was by him. Um, and I really can't remember what it's called. Um, w one of the things that when I started this off, because it was only supposed to be 10 or 20 pages, um, I didn't take any notes of where I got the information. And then as it got bigger, I read, oh my heavens, I've really got to have a reference section here. I don't think I've got a reference, but I think if you, if you look him up, I just see if here I do have, just on my notes in front of me, if I've got anything about it, but I don't think I do. But I think, if you look up 
um, that just the name of, uh, of, of him, you'll, you'll find it. Where on earth have I got this? No, I had hoped that I'd written, written it down here, but I haven't. Nope, I haven't. But uh, again, j just look up uh, John Toole and uh, actor, comic actor, and I think you'll find it. Great, and we've got um, a question from Maria. Um, she wants to know, um, is this talk promoting a book by Nick Ross about Orm Square? I would love to read more about his findings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't think that any great publisher is really going to be interested. One of the things I say at the beginning of this book is that most historians um, devote themselves to, you know, great global events, um, the royal lineage, uh, wars or whatever. And I, I've focused on, frankly, a dozen houses. It's hardly the stuff that's going to ignite the world of publishing. Um, but honestly, who, who knows? Keep, keep an eye out and uh, maybe an agent somewhere watching. Oh, yeah, this will sell even in, even in India. Who knows? Um, <laughs> I, I, in a funny sort of way, um, there the, the sh the should be a market for stuff like this because Orm Square is merely, as I said at the end, it's a microcosm of what's happening all over London and probably what happened. You could write this about Chicago. You could write this about Mumbai. You could write this about virtually any place if you if you look deeply enough. Well, I'd say there's a market for it among your audience this evening because they're not the only they're not the only comment that says it should be turned into a book. So uh, yeah. Definitely interest in a book out there. Um, we've got a comment, something I think you touched on in a conversation with us earlier. John Profumo lived in Orm Square during the scandal of the 1960s. Stephen Ward. Uh, Stephen, uh, well, actually, uh, Stephen Ward did. He lived just opposite Orm Square in Orm Court uh, with Christine Keeler. Um, uh, Though They didn't share a bed, by all accounts, because I think he was gay. Uh, and I'm always astonished that there isn't a blue plaque to them. I actually suggested this after I was doing this to, to a friend of mine who used to be on the blue plaque committee, but alas, he is not. I mean, I think that um, uh, Stephen Ward in particular deserves a, a blue plaque. I'm not going to go into the history for those who don't know it. Uh, Christine Keeler, who knows? But, um, you know, he committed suicide because he was wrongly accused by the establishment of, of, of all sorts of things. Um, yeah, he lived, uh, lived just across there, not actually in the square itself. Right. Um, we've got Valerie who says, thank you, that was excellent. Can you explain why you've decided to remodel your house? <laughs> why? Well, why we came to, to remodel our house was because when we came here, we weren't going to do very much to it, actually. Um, and we then were told by a friend of ours who is a serious architect, he said, look, this is actually a, quite an important house. Uh, don't, don't faff around with it. Why don't you get, uh, ask some architects to come up with some, some ideas? And so we did. We got uh, four architects. They didn't charge us for it, which is rather brilliant. Um, one was a real traditionalist. Uh, one was a sort of modernist. One um, was sort of middle of the road and one came up with an idea that completely astonished us. I mean, it was a, you know, a complete remodeling of the whole house, which we were not going to go for at all, not least on grounds of cost. Uh, and then English Heritage, um, to our surprise, really rather liked it because what had happened us in so much of London is accretion. Bits and pieces had been built on in different times. There had been an attempt in the 1930s to, to make something coherent, but then in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all sorts of bits have been put on there. So that's why we decided to almost go back to the drawing board and start again. We've had uh, lots of comments saying brilliant, great presentation, great research. So I'll spare your blushes by not reading those out, but um, I'll definitely feed those back to you later. Um, we've got a really interesting question here. Um, how easy was it to research during this lockdown? Well, difficult. And um, and actually, uh, Susie, thank you to you. Let me say this, because I mean, during lockdown, w w there were three or four little bits and pieces I couldn't get at because the, the archive was closed and you were going in any way and you said, well, I'll d dig them out for you, uh, which was really, really helpful. Um, other archives I haven't been able to get to. And in particular, I wanted something from the House of Commons library, which is which is closed. So. In one sense, it's difficult getting at original source material. In another sense, though, it's easy because 
I, I, there's no way I'd have done this had it not been for the lockdown. I mean, here I am stuck at home with time on my hands uh, and it just wouldn't have happened otherwise. So in one way, it's, it's facilitated it. Uh, and incidentally, there's a huge amount online. But once you go back before, well, really before the age the internet really got underway, uh, it, it becomes sparser and sparser and sparser. You've really got to go to source material. Had you actually started this research before lockdown or was it? No, no, it was completely a, as a result of, of lockdown. I mean, uh, uh, another neighbour and I, and I have been talking about this uh, for, uh, what, four years? Had done absolutely nothing about it. And it was only during lockdown. And I remember coming across some rather peculiar fact and that's what started me off and then getting more and more into it. I'll ask you what the peculiar fact was later. Um, I'll move on to Margaret. He says, thank you, fascinating and completely absorbing. Do you think you'll find the time for similar research into another 12 houses in London? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> in, in the hope that lockdown doesn't come back or, or once this one has, has finished, um, probably not. I mean, I am, there is a, a, an issue that I'm quite interested in getting into, but it's not really uh, about architecture or it's it's about a social policy which I think needs reforming very badly, um, which I won't go into now. But I suspect that's going to be my next immersion. Well, it's strange you said you won't go into it because that's actually the next question. Alex has said, "Fabulous research, thanks so much, Nick." What is your next research project? Um, I already can't wait to hear it. So, uh, <laughs> are you going to make Alex wait to hear that one? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, it's probably not going to be what the people would be interested in if they're tuning into this, which is. That's what I would have been interested in as well. Um, ever since I've been involved <clears throat> in crime prevention, um, I've been intrigued at how we use criminal law against people who've done something wrong by accident. <clears throat> and I got very much involved in a case of, of, of a woman called Hadiza Bawagaba, who was a doctor, a junior doctor, who made a mistake in treating a child and uh, the child died. And she was, uh, Dr. Baba Gaba was then convicted of uh, manslaughter. And it said to me, this is crazy. You take your child to a doctor. The doctor does her best. It's a rotten best. She does something absolutely she shouldn't do, but is then charged with manslaughter. And I've been looking at road accidents, people who have, I, I went to one uh, court of appeal and there was a guy who was uh, in a left turn lane, decided not to turn left, wasn't indicating left, decided to go straight on. A pedestrian walked in front of him, uh, assuming he was going to turn left. He hit her, he immediately stopped, did everything he could. And he was sent to prison for four years. And I'm just thinking, this is insanity. This is not justice. This is a sort of mad vengeance. So, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the whole array of this as how it's used, how it's not used in air crashes at all. Uh, but it is used in road crashes and it is used in lots of other things. It, it just seems to me society's got this completely wrong. But anyway, I'm going to do a whole lot of research into what the law is, how we got here, why so many people seem to want to keep it and whether if you explained that it doesn't do any good, there's not the slightest evidence it's ever saved a life. And I say that as someone who's been chairman of the National Road Safety Committee of ROSPA, it's never saved a life at all. Uh, why do we do it? That's that's my next project, I think. OK, like like Alex, I'll be very interested to, uh, to see how that goes. Um, we have actually reached the end of our, our advertised time, um, but we do have quite a lot more questions in the Q&A. Nick, are you OK for, to carry I'm on for a bit? If, if, if other people can, can okay. better stay on. <laughs> if there anyone, if there's anybody out there that does need to leave us now, um, then thank you very much for coming. Um, and there is going to be, we are going to be sending you a recording, um, a link to a recording of this talk. So if you want to hear the rest of the Q&A, um, you can do that. But we will press on. Um, got an anonymous question here. Hello, do you know what was previously the car park opposite Orm Square? Ah, good question. And that took me forever to find. You would have thought this would be obvious. It's another um, consequence of archives being closed. So I suspected it was part of Royal Palace grounds and indeed it was. It was uh, part of the original uh, vegetable gardens or wild gardens of, of Kensington Palace. It was uh, then sold uh, or leased actually as part of Kensington Palace Gardens. So those grand houses that, known as Embassy Row uh, that, that goes off Bayswater Road. 
uh, down towards uh, Kensington High Street. Three houses, in fact, the first three to be built were where that car park is now, number one, number two, number three. Beyond that are four and five, now the Russian embassy. And all the houses were built so grandly that they couldn't, uh, the, 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 no one, the royal estate couldn't find anybody to lease them at the beginning. And a lot of them fell into disrepair. And even though one, two and three were eventually leased uh, after the war, um, when this area of London was pretty down at heel, they really couldn't uh, do much with them and they were demolished. And like so many other areas of London, mostly bomb sites, it must be said, uh, they were just made into a car park. And they're absurd for such an amazingly important site in London. They have remained a coach and car park. Wow. Right, so I've got question from Ali. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you, Nick. What reading would you kindly recommend for those interested in the local history of central West London? Ooh, um, well, I'm now showing my own ignorance because I probably should have found lots of books had the libraries been open and gone and got them out and read lots. Probably what I would suggest is you read British history online. What that has done is taken a lot of uh, history books and condensed them or just taken great chunks of them. It, it sounds as though it's not very academic, but it is. It's a very, very good um, collection of, of um, well, a whole bunch of stuff, really, of British history online. I think a lot of the first early work um, that I did was, was enriched by that and, and many, many shortcuts to finding other things. Right. Uh, the next question is by from Alison Kenny, who is uh, somebody I know very well. She was um, an archivist um, at the Archive Centre till quite recently. Um, and she says, a masterly presentation as expected of a fascinating square. I'm interested in the Russian connections with Moscow Road and St. Petersburg Place nearby. It is said that Edward Orme sold gravel to Sir Alexander I when the latter was in London. Have you come across any evidence of this? No, and I've looked very, very hard. Um, and I think you've got to remember that in the, the, the uh, Sovereign's visit to London in 1814, uh, this is after the, the, what was then regarded as the war to end all wars against Napoleon. And the, the allies, uh, including the, the Tsar, the Emperor of Russia, were all invited to London and uh, went to a place in, in the park here. It was a huge thing. I mean, the Napoleonic Wars had gripped this country. The country had gone into a recession after after the wars, as, as it did after the, the Second World War. And so the sovereign's visit was a huge thing and the Tsar would have would have come past here. Um, whether the names had anything to do with Edward Orme, I don't know. I can't bottom that out. Bear in mind, as I said earlier, people tended to give names as they wanted. Uh, to their own properties. Uh, and often even the people who collected the rates would give different names to the same piece of, of, of property and the post office would often follow the, the chap who did the rates. Um, so at any rate, we know that uh, Orne Square was built in, well, the, the, the indenture I showed was 1820. So definitely no houses were built until 1821, enabled by an act of parliament incidentally. Um, and probably it weren't finished till 1825, 1826. Now that's 12 years after the Sovereign's visit. Um, I suspect that uh, those names were nothing to do with Orm, but we don't know. Most histories say Orm called them Moscow Road or Moscow Cottages and, um, and uh, St. Petersburg Place. But actually, as I showed that map, uh, the map that he signed, uh, it's called Chapel, Chapel Row. St. Petersburg place. So I don't know where those names came. They definitely came from the, the Tsar's visit uh, and the, his importance as an ally in the Napoleonic Wars. Whether they, they were uh, given the, to these roads by Orm, I don't know. Still some mysteries out there. That's good. Um, we've got another one. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. How difficult um, or straightforward was your research? Any particular challenges, lockdown aside? I mean, huge numbers of challenges, one of which is that I was only able to, to get flash gun uh, information about lots of things. For example, you've got the rate book. 
uh, unless I go through, uh, like, well, through every one I had time to do every year, but say the electoral register, which is the most wonderful thing, because that does tell you about the servants. It does tell you about the people who aren't themselves famous. Uh, they were only taken every 10 years. And I'd assume that that would give me a fairly good coverage, but it doesn't. I've realized in that time, you know, some of these houses would have had three or four different families in them. Uh, so, so that certainly wasn't, uh, hasn't, be, hasn't been easy. Um, the other thing that hasn't been easy is, uh, as, as, as I say, is once you get beyond the, the 1920s, 1930s, because it's still in living memory, nobody likes these things to be on the public record. For example, the census only gets published uh, after 100 years. So actually the biggest difficulty was after the Second World War. Also finding who the architects were of, of various houses because I couldn't get into the into Reba, the Royal Institute of British Architects. And it took me ages to find out about the houses we were just asked about earlier, which is now a, where, where the car park was opposite. Um, and it was only because I managed amazingly through a fluke um, to get in contact with somebody who lived in one of the houses in Norman Square many, many years ago, who had a photograph of themselves as a child with those houses showing in the background that I, that I even knew what they looked like. Brilliant. Um, got another one. Any insight into what the gardens in the centre of the square um, have been or are used for? Yes. Well, we know from a, a, the description from Carlisle's time uh, that it was a dingy plot. And we know that they've been in disrepair a lot of the time. And that's because of the, the tragedy of the commons, I think economists call it. Um, that's because um, if you had lots of owners, nobody took responsibility. When Orm, and probably one partner incidentally, a man called Ingle, uh, Ingle Wright, um, when, when uh, they owned the square, it was in their interest to keep the common parts looking good because they were renting out the properties, the leases depended, the value of the leases depended on how good it looked. But as it went to their descendants and houses got sold off bit by bit, um, no one was looking after the square. And we know it was in terrible disrepair because I've got old minutes from the Orton Square Garden Association of 1947 and discovered that a man called Tuke, T-U-K-E, had formed the Orton Square Garden Association. I discovered he worked for Warm, for Barclays Bank. So I looked up Barclays Bank and blow me down. It turns out he was chairman of Barclays Bank. And that was wonderful because Barclays Bank were able to tell me a lot about Tuke and had old documents and all sorts of things. So obviously it was in a terrible state, the gardens and the roadways in 1947. He then left the square soon afterwards. And we know that by the 60s, it was in a terrible state again. And by the time we moved here, we, we came here in 2012, I mean, the roadway was in a pretty poor condition. And the gardens, it was, there was no one really to look after the gardens, except for, for one, of, one resident did her best with the watering can. And it was only when we reformed the Orm Square Association, got everybody to subscribe. I mean, it's difficult. That's why we have local authorities to do things that people aren't prepared to do themselves. Most people won't go out in front of there, even out of, in front of a shop and sweep up the litter, take out the graffiti, um, look after the, the, the flowers. So we, we, you need an authority to do that. We've now got a committee that does it. My guess is if these things wane and uh, no doubt in time the garden will, will look pretty crappy again. But at the moment it's looking wonderful and um, uh, we've had some Dutch elm disease, but uh, other than that, no, it's looking very good. Right, we've got so many questions and I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get through all of them, so I'm, I'm just going to have to select a few. Um, but one that's actually come up twice is, um, if you're going to bury a time capsule, what would you select? Oh, I'd really like to think about that. Um, I think probably documents. I mean, I'm just so physical document and maybe it doesn't matter nowadays you could put it on a usb stick will they be able to read a usb stick in a thousand years time oh probably but that indenture that you had at the archives so many houses so many properties get bought and sold why was it that the local borough council originally had a copy of this archive with these original signatures on it why was it that people had the foresight to keep it 
And why was it that somebody had the foresight to establish a proper Westminster City Archive and have employ archivists to keep it? I don't know. But I, I think probably it would be documents, but I'd need to think about it. It's a really good question. Uh, I've got another question here. Did Spike Milligan not live in Orm Square? Spike Milligan lived uh, again just behind us in Orm Court. Um, it, with it, the black, the blue plaque to Spike Milligan beams down on, on our house. Uh, it's just around the corner at the back of Orm Court that the one for Stephen Ward uh, and Christine Keeler does not exist. But uh, yeah, he absolutely did live here. <laughs> We're getting lots more comments saying that people would like this in a book. So uh, yes, I think if there are any publishers out there, they might want to take note. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, we've got so many come through. Uh, we've got one from Antonia. Could you discuss the area's connection to the Tsar Alexander? Does that well, seem to the question you had earlier? Yes, I, as I said, Antonia, I, I think the connection was that the Tsar was visiting Hyde Park, which is where the great celebrations were. These were massive for the time. and. Um, I think that's where the names here come from. I may be wrong, it may be that Orm chose those names in order to big up his own properties, it, it, um, because obviously they were popular names at the time, being associated with Russia. And incidentally, he did. I don't believe he sold gravel to the Tsar. I don't believe the Tsar personally would have bought gravel. Um, it's possible that he sent gravel there, probably in, in, uh, in ships as ballast. Um, he certainly had connections with the royalty in Russia uh, because on his death, various bequests, which were, were clearly from the Russian royal family, uh, were, were, were part of his, his diary, well, not his diary, were part of, of what it were handed over when he died, were left behind when he died. Um, and it, we know that he sold various prints uh, and transparencies to the, to the Russian royal family as well. Right, I think, um, sadly, this might have to be our last question. Um, it's from Ali. Um, part and parcel of life is change and it is inevitable. However, subjectively speaking, it's quite sad for one to see the areas they grew up in change before their eyes. In your opinion, where do you think the balance lies between preservation and constant redevelopment stroke new development? Oh, crikey, that's such an important question. And um, of course, Western City Council is battling with this. One of the reasons, if you love London, you love London, is because we haven't conserved it. I mean, let's be blunt about this. If we had conserved it, it would be a completely different city. And at what stage would we have pickled it? Would we have pickled it uh, just after the Norman Conquest when basically um, you had that, what was supposed to be deliberately intimidating Tower of London, uh, a great prison, uh, was, was the, the biggest feature of London at the time? Would you have done it before the uh, Great Fire of London when it would have been impossible for this to become a serious working city in any modern way? Or would you, at what stage would one pickle what one's got? The fact that it's layer upon layer, that we keep some things, we, we renew things. The fact that new architecture, which is hated at the time, like St Paul's Cathedral, many, many people railed against it at the time, then become iconic uh, when they built the London Eye. There was huge objection to it. It was only permitted as a, uh, a for the millennium, and then it would have to come down because, of course, it was despoiling London, ridiculous thing to put on the river. I mean, try taking that down now. So our tastes change. So it's a very difficult question because it's a very difficult answer. What do you keep and what do you not keep? Um, and I think my view is you keep samples, but don't try and pickle everything. Where you've got a beautiful terrace row, and it's still pretty much as it was in, say, mid-Victorian times. Keep it. Um, where you've just got one surviving thing, keep it. But um, let's let don't be obsessional. Don't be obsessive. Would be my view. Okay, I think we'll, we're going to have to leave it there because we've uh, we've run out of over time quite a lot. Um, Nick, thank you so much um, for coming and doing this talk and being so generous with your time and your research. Um, and I would also like to thank the audience out there for for joining us tonight. And thank you for all all the lovely comments and the great questions that we've had. Um, I'm sorry we've not had a chance to ask all of them, but we will definitely show Nick um, everything that's been put in the Q and A. So. Um, yeah, it will be seen. Um, just to let you know that we'll be sending you an email. It should be flying out to your inbox around eight o'clock um, and it will contain a feedback form and it would be very useful to us um, if you could fill that in. Um, 
And it would also be nice to be able to feed your comments back to, to Nick. He can't see you out there. All you can see is his computer screen. So it's always it's always nice to be able to feed comments back to our speakers. Um, the email will also contain a link to the recording. So if you want to watch it all again, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and it will also have a link if you'd like to join our mailing list to find out about our future events. Uh, and also to lots of links, another link to the Westminster Library's Eventbrite page where you'll find loads of other events coming up. Um, I know that Marlebone Library have a great one on the 17th of March titled Ealing Down Under, which is uh, all about the films that Ealing Studio um, made in Australia, which should be fascinating. Um, also, before you go, I would like to tell you about our next event at the Archive Centre, um, and that will be on Wednesday, the 31st of May, and it's uh, London and Oral History, and uh, that will be the film production company Digital Works uh, talking about their oral history films. So that should be a really, really good talk. Um, we'll send you the details and hope you can join us then. Uh, well, that's that's it for this evening, folks. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Susie. Thanks, Julian. And thank you all. Bye bye. <laughs>